This is the Week in Sustainability from Sustain Life. It's where our team of sustainability experts and practitioners share commentary to keep you up to date on developing stories and news. Hi, I'm Melissa Raid, Chief Sustainability Officer at Sustain Life, and I am joined today by Hannah Asofsky, a data analyst on our sustainability team. Hi, Hannah. Hey, Melissa. <laughs> All right, so we have two stories for everyone this week. Number one, we're going to talk about insurance providers pulling out of the California homeowners market. Uh, for what reason? Climate change, spoiler alert, uh, as well as some lesser known impacts of the changing environment with the world's newest seaweed hotspot, the Great Atlantic Sargasm Belt. So I'm going to kick it off with this insurance story for everybody. Uh, for those who may have read the news, this was heavily covered topic uh, over the past week. But two major insurers, State Farm and Allstate, have both stopped offering new homeowners insurance policies in California. Why would they do this? Uh, it is due, exclu not exclusively, but in very large part to climate change related disasters. So things like fires and mudslides, which have become so prevalent that insurers are literally going out of business trying to pay out policyholders for damage done to their homes. And just to give you a sense of how big of a deal this is, for those who don't know, California is the largest state economy in the U.S. and the fifth largest in the world. So the fact that these insurers are pulling out of these huge markets is a really big deal. Yeah, uh, this is such a clear example of an economic reaction to the climate crisis. I, I suppose this isn't shocking given the national increase in climate-driven disasters, but beyond wildfires across the West, you know, we're seeing hurricanes in states like Florida and Texas, and then really any coastal area is facing sea level rise and more destructive so storm surges and increased flooding. It just, it makes sense. Yeah, totally. And so while to date, these insurers have only pulled out of the California market, I frankly wouldn't be shocked if we see similar actions across states like Florida and Louisiana, which have billions of dollars worth of damage over the past several years from hurricanes and flooding. Um, and it's it's not just climate change that's impacting the insurance industry. There's actually a lot going on with some other economic and even regulatory um, kind of uh, conditions and dynamics that are coinciding with these climate change impact events. So in California, for instance, regulators actually have blocked insurers from raising rates. Um, so while that obviously keeps costs down and manageable for homeowners, it makes it a lot harder for the insurers to cover costs of their policies for these increased payouts in that region. And so there's been this artificially low price ceiling for homeowners insurance in areas where the risk has exponentially increased due to these climate change disasters. So there's this significant misalignment in risk pricing, which frankly is a fundamental function and very salient ability of, of an insurance operator. Right. You know, I, it's tough to think about what this is going to mean for the insurance industry. You know, they, they have to raise rates, but that's really going to upset homeowners who are already facing inflation and rising interest rates. You know, regulation will prevent them from leaving, but they could just go out of business. You know, as a, as a resident of, of Florida, one of these really sort of hard to insure states, I don't love seeing my options shrink when companies like Allstate and State Farm pull their coverage. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's also, if you're familiar, it's, it's frankly difficult to get a mortgage on the property if your home isn't insured. And so there's actually an environmental justice issue at play here because these rising rates are going to make it unaffordable for certain residents to live in these more disaster prone areas. So imagine co very desirable coastal beachfront properties are really becoming exclusively for the elite because residents simply cannot afford to own and insure homes there. Um, I'll also note, and you're probably familiar with this in Florida, that some states have state-backed insurance providers, like Florida, for instance, has, I think it's the Citizens Property Insurance. And that's actually become the largest insurer in the state with over 1.2 million customers. So in the event that that company you know, has extreme weather events and needs to do these payouts to customers, it could actually wind up being frankly, public tax dollars that almost bail out these insurance providers. So we could expect to see the impact of that to the average taxpayer. But, you know, all to say that I would frankly expect a massive overhaul to the insurance industry in terms of 
how they are pricing and assessing risk. I think it's quite clear the old models don't work, right? The risk that was acceptable and standard and normal 20 years ago isn't the same risk or risk modeling that we know today. And it's not going to be the risk and risk modeling of 20 years from now. And it's just such a clear indication of how climate change and its impacts are really just that. This, these aren't just ecological services. This is a critical impact to our daily life, societal structures and economy. Um, and just a really, I think, salient, um, you know, opportunity for us to connect with that if, you know, for those that aren't as necessarily connected to the physical changes, you know, of, of climate change. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, the Florida Citizens Property Insurance Plan. There's some really interesting things going on. You know, it's like California makes the choice to regulate the a limit on on how insurance can treat these logical rises in rates and sort of prevents the rates from rising. But Florida chose a different mechanism. And even though that public option is a really popular option, they're also kind of limiting residents in their ability to join that option as a way of pushing the private plan and sort of honoring the, the private insurance company. So you're not allowed to join that public plan unless you cannot find a broad private option within a certain price uh, threshold of um, mm. of the public option. And so you know, it's it's really interesting because the the climate disaster or the climate crisis is making all of these disaster events that we're already familiar with, like hurricanes and wildfires, more aggressive and less predictable. And that's sparking this huge business reaction from insurance companies. But there are also going to be some impacts that are are events that we're less familiar with. There, this climate crisis is toiling with natural processes that we can't completely predict, and so. What I'm talking about is that we are experiencing one of these right now in the Caribbean and then the U.S. states that Gulf, uh, the border, the Gulf of Mexico with the Great Atlantic Sargasm Belt. And essentially, human activities are causing this explosion in seaweed growth that's having unpredictable and, and kind of nerve wracking impacts. Oh, my gosh. OK, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. We tend to discuss climate change in terms of, you know, how we observe ecology and the natural environment to change. Plus, of course, those like societal mechanisms that we've talked about, like the insurance. But, you know, we are uh, altering the world in ways that we don't see in places where we don't live, where we don't do activities. So, you know, um, seaweed growing in the ocean doesn't sound so new or so upsetting. What's what's yeah. the big deal about it? Uh, absolutely. It sounds like exactly what is supposed to be happening is happening you know why why is this is concerning um have you have you heard of the sargasso sea by any chance? i have yeah no it's off it's off the east coast of north america right right the so the sargasso sea is off of our east coast in the u.s in the atlantic ocean and it's the main hot spot where this seaweed called sargasm grows and these big patches of sargasm float on the surface they create a really important habitat for birds and turtles and fish Occasionally, small patches will break off and, and wash up on shore. That's business as usual. We've all been on a beach that had a little bit of seaweed on it. But what's happening now is that a new hotspot of sargasm is, is popping up and growing at a really fast, increasing pace since 2011. So this new patch is what's called the Great Atlantic Sargasm Belt. It's much further south of the Sargasso Sea and stretches from the west coast of Sierra Leone all the way across the Atlantic, through the Caribbean, and up into the Gulf of Mexico. This is a belt that's uncontained by the swirling of the Sargasso Sea, so we are seeing millions of pounds of seaweed wash up on shore. That's not an exaggerated number. Wow. Okay, that's crazy. I'd like to first state my opinion in that. What a name for this phenomenon, the Sargasm Belt. <laughs> it's Absolutely. Really amazing. Okay, so... That actually is kind of incredible to think of this band of seaweed going all the way from the west coast of Africa through the ocean all the way to the Gulf. What is causing this? Right. Uh, in, in the biggest picture, we are. Um, you know, this this new belt isn't a natural phenomenon from sargasm just breaking off from the Sargasso Sea and happening to thrive elsewhere. 
This is this belt formed in 2011 following years of record flooding coming out of the Amazon. So floodwaters carry really nutrient dense water out into the Atlantic. This is from agricultural runoff and deforestation debris and it bumps into ever warming ocean water and sargasm growth is more successful than we'd like it to be. And so now these rafts that break off from the belt are much larger than the ones we're typically used to. And the U.S. is, is spared from a lot of it, but most of this wash up is coming up in the Caribbean islands, but it's getting a lot worse in Florida. Yeah. And and for those who don't know, that's something you feel in a very real way being a, a Florida resident. But so like, what does this impact look like? Does this mean when we go to the beaches in South Florida and the Yucatan Peninsula of, of Mexico, like, are we, is this going to be um, competing with precious real estate with sargasm seaweed? Yeah, that's, that's definitely part of it. You know, the tourist economies in the Caribbean and, and coastal Florida are spending a lot of time and a lot of money deploying crews and vehicles that remove this seaweed um, and, yeah, you know, I haven't mentioned this part yet. This sargasm, it smells terrible, like rotten eggs to be generous. It releases the hydrogen sulfide that we sort of attribute to marine plant life. Um, so that's a really big inconvenience for beachgoers. And it's an expense for beach maintenance, but it also is a threat to economies that rely on tourism. That's sort of the simple answer. But beyond that, there, there are real human health and ecological impacts of this new growth. Oh, really? What kind of human health impacts? Right. The the hydrogen sulfide, it's miserable to be around, to to put it simply. But, you know, the, the crews that are on these beaches every day and handling the plant are facing eye and throat and skin irritation. That's the most apparent issue connected to the plant itself. And that gets even worse for the people that happen to be in enclosed spaces with the plant. You know, there's there's a lot of sort of processing uses with the seaweed. So it's it's taken elsewhere. And then you have to be indoors with this like really smelly off gassing. Um, and then, you know, but then there's another threat that happens to involve a new material that we've, you know, never experimented with putting in our water systems within the last 50 years. Okay. I feel like you're alluding to plastic. So is this a problem of plastic getting tangled up in the seaweed and coming on shore? Yeah, totally. Um, you know, so not only does plastic itself just get wrapped up in a seaweed, and that is a threat to the wildlife that inhabit the patch, but it also is attracting a very specific kind of bacteria. The bacteria is called Vibrio, and there are a lot of kinds of Vibrio. It's not all harmful. It's not all scary. Um, but there are some that really are a big uh, imposition to human health. And so public researchers have warned that warm ocean conditions and plastic presence among seaweed, because the bacteria is attracted to plastic, creates a perfect environment for Vibrio to thrive. As humans, the main way we can become infected with Vibrio previously was infected uh, shellfish. So public health departments have been sort of used to that for a while. But now with these increases of seaweed rushing up onto shore with plastic and an increased presence of Vibrio, you have to be kind of careful. And there haven't been very many cases of it yet but it's absolutely something that public health departments are worried about. Oh, okay. All right. So another great PSA warning against plastic. What's the main ecological concern here when it comes to wildlife's access for plastic? Right. Yeah. So obviously we've all sort of seen the turtle that eats plastic. It's That's a huge consequence. You know, this is, like I said, stretching from Africa to the Gulf of Mexico, that's a really large amount of wildlife that can interact with basically a, a net for plastic. Um, so that's that sort of larger wildlife threat. But beyond that, these sargasm belts like choke out coral reefs as if they have not been through enough. These sargasm patches suffocate them from light and from oxygen. And they're they're occurring right in the exact same region that coral reefs grow on, you know, in this continent. Um, so to give you an idea of just like exactly how aggressive these patches can be, last year, St. Croix was under a state of emergency for 18 days because the sargasm patch choked out their desalinization plant. So it, it just fully encapsulates the island and you have to figure out how to get rid of it. Wow. That's crazy. I mean, it's just such another prime example of how 
environmental impacts are not isolated from our society and our civic infrastructure and how we actually operate our communities. And, you know, while of course the, if, as if the environmental impact wasn't enough, this is an economic impact. I mean, this is really observing how these changes are becoming quite costly and so expensive for us to accommodate as a society. Absolutely. And we're only going to see that more, you know, the, the more damage a coral reef faces, the more fish that ingest plastic, it's just going to get worse. And, and right, we, we can prepare for a lot of things and we can also sort of lack the planning necessary for a lot of these things too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, those are our two stories for the week. We want to thank everybody for joining us uh, and we will see you next week for more news in sustainability. Sustain Life is a sustainability management SaaS platform with deep carbon expertise that helps future-proof small and medium-sized enterprises by taking climate action. Go to sustain.life to learn more. Thanks for listening and watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel or your favorite podcast platform. We'll see you next week.